Saturday seminar coming up, December 8th, how to qualify for mortgages. Rick Gurgis, our fellow on the left there, uh, is um, uh, one of the many lenders. We have their business associates. Rick will be teaching how to qualify for uh, mortgages. I presume this is going to be a, a rental or is this going to be occupant? Or both? Both. Okay, both. So if you are questioning whether you qualify or you don't know how you qualify for a rental loan or for an occupant loan, this uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday, December 8th, uh, with Rick, he'll answer all your questions. Uh, and then the, uh, it, the, uh, our, this meeting happens on the second Monday of every month. Uh, we have 19 subgroups per month. Just go to garea.com and click calendar. All of those evening meetings come with your membership. So you go to garea.com and you can do that on your cell phone. But we're going to have uh, our main program come up. Uh, Get Smart. Now the uh, that's uh, uh, remember him. Get Smart. Uh, that's a shoe phone. Uh, Get Smart with your corporate structure, income uh, strategy, and tax planning tonight. Uh, so getting ready to start our program. So Rick. I wonder if you can uh, introduce uh, and start our program off. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this is a uh, bright and intelligent group. I'm glad you guys came to uh, learn a little bit about uh, taking full advantage of the opportunities that are allowed. Uh, attorney Sam McGuire is here to talk about LLCs. Uh, he's going to start off. And then um, we're going to talk about how this all ties in with financing briefly. And then we're going to pass the microphone to uh, Eric, who flew here from California, um, to tell us about cost segregation accounting, opportunity zones, uh, uh, touch on uh, 1031 exchanges, and um, other topics that I can't possibly do justice in this short period of time. So first, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, the attorney, Sam McGuire. He's uh, an Atlanta-based attorney, been here for a couple decades at least. And uh, he's going to talk about LLC formations and other relevant items. Thank you, Sam. Hey, thank you all so much. Rick, I don't know how you convinced me to do this. This is probably the most boring topic, but um, I don't think uh, as a real estate investor you could ever come to one of these events and not hear the word LLC. So I'm going to demystify that for you. So. Two things you need to put in your mind right now. You need to put in first, it's 1975. The second thing you need to put in your mind, I'm talking about one to two people, okay? One to two people, not four people, not five people. It's one person or two people investing in a business. It's 1975. And let's say this person is red, and he's got a gelato machine, and he wants to start selling gelatos in 1975. He comes to my office, 100% at 100% of the time, I'm gonna set up a corporation for him. Well, I'm gonna ask him, does he have any other investors? Rick's gonna say, no. And we're gonna set up Rick in a corporation. Why are we gonna do that? Well, at that time, we really didn't have LLCs. We didn't know what the hell that meant. So we put him in a, in a corporation, and the corporation would be a board of directors. I'd ask Rick, who's gonna be the president? Who's gonna be the treasurer? Who's gonna be the secretary? Rick says, I'm going to be all three of those. Set them up. Easy, bam, 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 done. Okay, so then let's say it's 1977. The state of uh, Wyoming came out with its legislation. First state. It totally was, everybody blew it off, meaning that no one knew about this new legislation. It talked about limited liability companies. Ten more years go past. Corporations, 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 corporations. The next thing that happened was the state of Delaware. They figured this out. They said, you know, we're going to go in and we're going to create a unique company. And we're going to basically give limited liability to the members and we're going to allow pass-through taxation through the members to the individual person, just like the corporation. All right, so that became the gold standard right there, right in 1977. Still, we're setting up corporations and corporations. I wouldn't say until probably about, in, in my time, I'd say about 2000, 2001, we started seeing limited liability companies. So what is the real, real difference of a limited liability company versus a corporation? So the key thing with a limited liability company is the members themselves actually can run the company if they want to, 
They can own the company. They can set up a corporate structure if they want to. So in other words, you can set up a president, you can set up a vice president, you can set up a secretary. Those people can run the company and the members themselves can actually just be unit owners and be passive if they want to. Um, and so what's happening now is if you're owning real estate, you do not want to have a corporation. You really want to have an LLC. And the reason for that is LLC allows the flexibility to bring on other members or investors, if you want per se. And then you can actually identify unique relationships. You can have voting rights, you can have one class of, of members. You can have voting class to another set of members. Where it's, you can't do that in a corporation. And so the corporations, when you're owning real estate, has just kind of gone by the wayside. And so the, the unique structure that we're seeing and we're basically recommending is an LLC. And you can get the same liability, the same pass-through taxation, but you have so much more flexibility with this thing called this operating agreement. Now, do not get confused what an operating agreement is. All the operating agreement is, is similar to a roadmap. It's your ways. It's your, it's your um, garden angel whenever you want to dictate what's going on in your business. You can sit there and structure your operating agreement exactly how you want to deal with your partners. Um, you want to deal with your succession rights, meaning that, let's say you're a family, and you're a family-owned LLC, and you're worried upon death, who's going to take over the company, who's going to run the company. So you can dictate all these things within the operating agreement. And this makes it very, very easy uh, whenever one partner wants to get out, one partner wants to get in, you want to get an investor. It's just very, very functional. So I highly recommend LLCs over operating agreements, over uh, corporations. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Do you recommend that people form an LLC per property? All right, that's a very good question. So Rick and I have actually talked about this. So if you are going out and buying uh, real estate, the recommendation is to form an LLC, have that LLC own that particular property. Um, so then the, 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 the second question Rick would say, well, what if I own two properties, three properties? You have like a couple of different ways to look at that. One is, are you, are you going to set up maybe a standard where the LLC will have a value of like $1 million or $1.5 million? And then once it reaches $1.5 million in value, you set up another LLC and then that will uh, be a holder of either one property or several properties. Me personally, I recommend having an LLC per property because if you ever have any type of liability, which is a vendor gets pissed off and, want, and comes after you, or you get a, a, a situation with a, a tenant, gets upset, comes after you, or you have something really serious and someone falls off the roof, hurts themselves really badly, and they sue you. So what you can do with these LLCs is you can collapse it per property. So let's say, for example, you have one incident on one property, it would affect everything under that LLC. Okay, technically. But, we, but there's, more, there's more steps that they have to go through to actually pierce what they call the corporate veil. All right, so I recommend uh, an LLC per property because that affords the most amount of protection for you, the individual. Now, if, um, before I get to any questions, now if you want to screw up the LLC, let me tell you how to do that. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing you don't do is set up an LLC and then just go on down the road. So if you set up an LLC, that's the best thing you've ever done. Uh, the second thing you've got to do is you've got to identify a very, very good accountant because you're not going to be able to file a tax return without an accountant to sign those returns. You're not going to be double taxation. You're not going to be double taxed on that. It's going to be a pass-through. It's going to go to you individually. It's going to be a scheduled item. But the but accountant has to do that for you. You cannot do that on your own. Yes, sir. Oh. Okay. Um, the, the next thing I was going to tell you, the, the, what most people do when they screw up with, uh, their LLCs is they commingle funds. So if you set up an LLC, you, number one, you go get an accountant, get them signed up. The second thing you do is you got to go get a bank account. And this has got to be a real bank account, meaning that you bring in real income, you pay expenses out of this, do not commingle of money. You commingle money, you're giving us attorneys a gateway to come in and pierce that and call this a sham LLC, and we're gonna come after you. We're gonna come get you. Because it's easy. You're just giving you an easy avenue. 
So you make it simple on yourself, self LLC, get an accountant, get a bank account, and operate like a company. It's that easy. And then, um, and then just go on down the road, and when you get another one, you set up another one. So one of the questions that Rick had for me, he said, Sam, this is great, but what if you want to go borrow money and you have an LLC? Well, that's a problem because most of the lenders out there only want to lend to individuals. So what happens is you're going to have to apply for a loan, individual capacity, and then you're going to transfer it into an LLC. Well, then you'll say, well, Sam, that's going to violate my due on sale clause. If you look in your security deed, it says you transfer this, you're violating the due on sale clause, me, the lender, can call that loan due. So that is a risk that you have to run. We are, we are setting up these LLCs all the time. I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm not saying that it's okay because everybody else is doing it. I'm just telling you it's protection and it is a calculated risk that you have to take. Because what, one of the things you do, one of the things the lenders are looking for is the transfer of interest and they look, they really keys them off are the insurance policy. So when you see the loss payee change from the individual into an LLC, that triggers it. So one of the things I suggest is to be transparent, is you're not trying to hide anything. You set up the LLC, you transfer it into the LLC, and then you, on the insurance policy, you're named insured jointly with the LLC. And then if you're ever called due, if the, if the lender ever calls you due, which I have not seen uh, in a long time, I mean a very, very long time, then you just transfer it back into the LLC, into the individual capacity. And then you're, you're, and you're back in good graces for your lender. But I have not seen any issues in this day of time. I'm not you know, telling you that you're guaranteed success with this, but I'm just telling you it's a smart thing to do to sell the LLC. And if the lender ever questions you, um, and then you have an issue where they're saying that we are going to call this a default, then you just immediately would transfer it back into the, you as an individual and go on down the road. But I, I just have not seen any issues when uh, if you keep your mortgage current, you keep uh, the insurance policy and you as a named insured, also jointly with LLC, I've seen that kind of basically you're good to go. Sam? Yeah. yeah. Um, I use the terms to uh, create my LLCs. What are the problems with creating your own LLC since it's so easy these days? Well, one of the things uh, with creating your own LLC is sometimes you don't foresee the unknown, meaning that <clears throat> a lot of times people just take this uh, cookie cutter operating agreement, they put it together, and they don't realize that they are creating, they don't have any succession rights in there, they don't have any issues if they have a partner, uh, they haven't even thought through that, they haven't thought through um, if, the, if the LLC fails, I mean, what are we going to do? Or the most common thing that I'm seeing now is one of the members gets sick. And then out of the blue gets sick, and then next thing you know, the families pick up the pieces, and we're pulling out the operating agreement, and we got a problem. So that's probably the most real issue that I'm dealing with right now, is one of the members gets sick all of a sudden, no one's looking, we pull out that portfolio, and next thing you know, we got these jacked up operating agreements, and we're having a code kind of manufacturer who has the rights in order to transfer property to a, a successor manager, or do we dissolve it? And then making sure we dissolve this in an ethical and uh, you know, and we have the right members. Sam, um, do you sue people? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, so uh, I'm happy long. Okay. <laughs> when you create your own LLC, you'll see in the Secretary of State's um, you'll see on the Secretary of State's uh, website LLC ABC LLC and a person's name uh, John Doe. But if an attorney sets up an LLC yeah. deals and make it all worthwhile, also use LLCs, taxes, escort, and then talk about that. Well, um, uh, two things about uh, husband and wife. Um, who's going to be the decision maker? So I have some situations where the husband and wife comes in, they've already determined which one's going to be the decision maker. We make that one manager, and then we make both of them members, but 50% ownership of the entity. Then we have uh, the situation where they want to be co-managers. So what we do is we don't really declare it by a manager. We just have husband and wife as members themselves. And then they jointly make decisions, and they declare who will actually uh, sign on behalf of them at the, at the transaction. But they jointly make decisions. So then the ultimate question is the S, uh, basically the, the subtitler S uh, declaration. 
is you, you still can declare under the LLC this a subchapter S, which means the, the LLC is not gonna be taxed. It passes through to their individual tax return as a scheduled item. You still have distributions, and then, um, and then the negative thing is if there's you know, an equity event that we have to um, basically, we all got to chip in some money, how are we going to do it? And let's say um, I don't, I have like 5,000, but Rick's going to chip in 10, how do we deal with that? The operating agreement will deal with the different distributions and then our capital accounts. And it's really easy to do. So that when we do make money, it, you know, five years, four years down the road, it will go back in time to say, well, well hey, Rick, you know, cash in $10,000 equity, I only put in five, and it balances the, the distribution out to us. Yeah, Bill? I have a question. Um, if you're doing different types of investing, for instance, if you're doing buy and hold as well as flipping, shouldn't you have uh, two separate LLCs? Uh, yeah, I would totally recommend that. I mean, um, my theory on <clears throat> properties is you need to have you know, probably one, two, or three LLCs. You have a management LLC, and then you have a holding LLC. And I totally, totally agree with that. Right, the, the, the uh, flipper or wholesaler uh, LLC, you can take advantage of tax law if that's taxed as an escort. You, you know that, Bill. So you're trying to, you're trying to lead us into that because uh, Bill's an LLC expert as well. So your, your buy and hold LLC needs to be passed through so that it ends up on your Schedule E. So buy and hold is passed through. Flipping or uh, wholesaling, or in my case, property management, an active um, uh, business, uh, best be taxed as an escort. Sam, what's the best way to dissolve an LLC? Just go pay the annual fee? I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. All right, so me as an attorney, uh, and nothing against, I, I just I hate that when it happens. Um, I like to be transparent. Um, all right, so. The key is dissolve it. It's very easy to do. Secretary of State has steps to dissolve it. I would just go ahead and dissolve it. Um, but if you want to just do nothing, not pay your annual fee, it's going to show up. You didn't pay your annual fee. It's, it's administratively dissolved. So, you know, it's less effort, but it's just, I, my belief is, if you're going to dissolve it, just be transparent about it. Oh, I have a question. Uh, are there any issues with uh, two irrevocable living trusts being owners of the LLC to take care of the probate issue. Now we're talking about probate and then... Right, you have an LLC, but the two owners, two, two members are irrevocable living trusts. Could be husband and wife, but each one has their own irrevocable, irrevocable living trust. Can that be used to avoid the issue of probate? You, you, can't, you can't avoid probate. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, two, it's two separate things. So um, you still, I mean, the whole issue is you still got to probate your estate to some degree. And so, but you're, if you have a very savvy um, uh, tax attorney and sets up your tax planning, um, you, you know, they will set up these trusts in a way to where you minimize probate. Why, you, why are they irrevocable? Why do you think they're irrevocable? <coughs> they're irrevocable because while you're living, you have control over it. And if you die, you've already designated uh, who takes over the living trust. So, so in effect, it's always going on until the final person dies. So you have the whole thing about succession. You have the whole thing of succession defined in your living trust. But what, what, what's the, I mean, what's the end game for avoiding probate? What, I mean, what's the big deal? I'm from California. I've been in a living trust for 20 years. Yeah. I believe in living trust. There are a lot of advantages to living trust. Oh, I told, I told, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I mean, I, I think there, there's a lot of advantages to living trust. That's like a separate entity versus the probate. And so the probate is easy here. I mean, it's, it's simple. And so if you have a, the trust, you have wills, it makes things easy. And then for the people that are left to basically administer the, whatever the, the wishes of the trust or the wishes of the LLC, the probate is just like a, a simple to do. Question. Uh, I've gotten a lot of people call at the LLC, and somehow they find me, like down in Bad Street or other people looking for property. And so I try to stay out of, you know, not, not give any information. What would you recommend on that? Keep yeah. yourself less. That's a great question. That's the new trend now. So um, everybody's wanting to kind of be incognito. And so they're getting attorneys to set them up, or the, uh, the attorneys are setting up registered agents. So um, I've got a bunch of clients now to where they don't want anybody to know who the world they are. 
period. And so what we're doing is we're setting up these reservations to where they are nationally registered in every state and they're the ones that are the agent and if they need to contact anybody, they see this, this uh, national agent that's out there, it costs like $140 uh, a year. And, um, and then when they go to sign an instrument, they do not have their name on any instrument so that you can go and look at their name. They have basically a designated signing agent or, a, or a, uh, a signing agent of someone else. Could be the accountant, could be um, a friend, could be a lawyer, could be anybody. And so they're just not being, they're not out there a public record on anything. But that's, that's a big print. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you can contact me, but I'm just giving you tools so you can set, set this up. So what, can you explain what winds up being the outcome if you have a multi-member LLC and someone does get sick or someone does pass away? Well, it's, it's all based on the operating agreement. So let's say it's a family. It's a family LLC and we've got um, brother A who's managing the LLC. So, and then we have three members. And the members are basically the sisters and other brothers of, of the family. So what you'll do is you just designate when the manager is incapacitated or, or deaf, who the, who the successor manager is. And, it's, it's, and it makes it very, very easy. So then you'll meet and then you'll amend the operating agreement to reflect the new manager. Like, like for example, I had uh, the, the um, unfortunate uh, client that um, the brother uh, died in a plane accident one day. And, um, and he was a manager. And then they came in and then we had to, uh, we got the death certificate and then we did a couple of things. It's very, it's very simple to do. And then you had the successor manager and then you're good to go. Is there any law conversation to like, the state of the person that, that set up? No, it's all set up in the operating agreement. So you know, some of them set up uh, different, you know, first to die policies and things like that. So it's all set up, you know, in your operating agreement. We don't see that too much, you know, with real estate related matters. We see that more with businesses. So let's say like you're creating a business with some other a friend and you're growing this business, then you see first to die policies in, in the operating agreements. Is it a negative when, when real estate is involved? No, no, it's not a negative. It's just the, the real estate, you'll, you'll see the LLCs that are set up sophisticated like this gentleman, you know, he has trust and it's, a, it's more of a family succession type thing like he's got set up. Then you've got a, a true business where people are buying and holding, people are flipping, and those are set up very, very simply. You'll have either a, a one person that owns it or you maybe have another um, partner who doesn't where one manages and one is possibly um, the investor, the seed money person. And then you just you make it very simple of how you're going to split the dollar and how you split expenses. And then outside the operating agreement, you set up different types of contractual agreements. Like for example, if you have an LLC and you're trying to build a property, you could have like one of the members, it happens to be the builder, and then one of the other members happens to be the money guy. Could be a money gal too. So so money gal. And um, and so you have a separate agreement with the LLC with that member at his separate company as the builder. And so everything you can do is just keep the operating agreement the same, but then you can set up these little side agreements with the member who happens to have another company that is the contractor. So I mean, it's, it's all kinds of creative ways to do this. Yes, sir. I have a kid that's approaching college age and I've been told that um, that if you own property as a single member LLC pass-through, uh, that that asset is reportable on the FAFSA, but if you own it as a multi-member S-Corp LLC, it's not reportable. Can somebody ver validate that for me? So it's, it's a bad idea to own uh, rental property that should be scheduled in an S-Corp because uh, you lose the depreciation pass through down onto your personal 1040. So, uh, so what was the reporting part, FASL? I didn't understand that. So when you, when you apply for federal financial aid, you have to report your assets. Oh, so uh, hiding uh, assets is not something I know much about, but I think you're running a risk <laughs> into, you know, if you own the property and then you, you move it and you hide it, I'm not sure what, 
which, you know, that's a good idea. But let me just comment on operating agreements. If you get a death situation, you now have to negotiate with the um, uh, surviving spouse as to inheritance and how um, uh, that, that's handled. But it's, if it's before any bad event, you can edit the operating agreement yourself. It's better to use an attorney because the attorney knows all the ins and outs. That's, that's what we're talking about tonight and why we're having this discussion about LLCs is because you don't know everything as a layperson who's not been through the educational process of running uh, companies uh, and seeing operating agreements. So using, I use an attorney to write my operating agreements that has all of these issues. I'm a, I'm a member, a uh, partner in a commercial deal and I paid we paid uh, an attorney to write our operating agreement, and it included secession in case there's death. Does the surviving spouse have voting rights? And we said no, but uh, she does, uh, or the surviving spouse, him or her, uh, receive the benefits of the ownership, but they don't have voting rights. So if you had nothing in your operating agreement, perhaps uh, a member dies, now you have the spouse voting on your uh, operation of your business. So you need to handle these things if you have complication. If you got something simple, okay, then you can get by with a, uh, a vanilla generic operating agreement. But if you have any kind of complications, then it's better to have, it doesn't cost much really. Uh, it only costs me $6.95 for my attorney. Uh, and so you're probably in the ballpark to create an LLC and customize the, L the operating agreement for you. Good. That's, that's great. Um, I'm going to have to end on this so that we could go on uh, off the deep end. The key things for y'all's takeaway on this is you, the operating agreement is, is your friend. Um, it helps you where you're not partners with people that you didn't sign up to be partners with. It helps dictate you know, what you're going to do with expenses. Uh, if someone dies, it gives you a succession plan. It gives you also an opportunity to where you can force the sale. You know, a lot of people don't, you know, if, if, if you know, Joe Blow passes away, we may want to go ahead and force sale the property. Um, I still say Georgia is a great state to go ahead and, and uh, form an LLC in. But once you start getting bigger and bigger and bigger, start looking at Delaware. But thank you so much. I've got one, one last question on operating, operating agreements. Is the operating agreement uh, filed or recorded at the Secretary of State? Is it held by the attorney or just kept by the members of the LLC? That's a great question. The uh, operating agreement is a private document. You want to hold on that like gold because you do not want anybody really to see your operating agreement unless you have to. And so whenever you have to give any assertions of who has um, authority to sign, you really want to hold on that operating agreement and not give kind of uh, whomever you have to give it to, you know, the roadmap to your organization, showing other partners and so forth is, is my recommendation. Yes, sir. Uh, now, when you're doing a closing, Yes, sir. It's because it's a certificate of incumbency, and so you can give them that. But what the problem is is it needs to come from either your, like your accountant or your lawyer, and then they'll pretty much back away because that person's kind of saying, "I'm asserting that this person is authorized on behalf of the LLC." Um, but when the individual is, is coming forward, um, they don't want to see the operating agreement, and then. Um, if, if y'all need ever want to contact me, it's Sam McGuire. I'm at 404-257-8885. Uh, and my background is I do anything I do with uh, residential and commercial real estate. I've been doing this for 24 years. And before that, I was a lender. Uh, I did that for nine years. And then I have a title company called Augusta Title. And we do title searches over the whole state of Georgia. And, um, and I mainly do commercial uh, transactions with uh, uh, Augusta Title. So people hire me when uh, the title's tough, and um, if you have any unusual contractual things, I can basically draft stuff from scratch. And, um, and we do a lot with DeKalb County, a lot with Fulton County, the legal department, um, tax by face, and things like that. So that's me in a nutshell. Can you give us your number? Oh, yeah, 404-257-8885, and it's Sam McGuire. For an LLC, are there any requirements about having an annual meeting, minutes, and so forth, that's, like that's it would with an S Corp or a, a C Corp? Yes, sir. There, there are some formalities you have to go through on an annual basis. It's designated in your operating agreement. 
And so the formalities in LLC are a little bit more loose than they are in a corporate uh, status. So that's another reason to have an LLC because the formalities are not as strict, but you designate that in your operating agreement. But you do still have to go through an annual meeting or some type of uh, organizational minutes, it's a. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. What was that, a year ago? Uh, Kurt talked me into going on a cruise, and it was called uh, Captains of the Caribbean. And Captains of the Deal. Captains of the Deal. And uh, that might be something else. And uh, we, uh, um, I got to meet about, uh, you know, two, three hundred different investors. Um, most of them are crazy. Uh, they all have great perspectives. Wildly enough, a lot of them probably didn't have a car to sleep in in 2008 or nine and made millions in that period of time between then and now. And uh, um, when I heard their stories, I was impressed. And it, it's the foundation for one of the points I'm about to make. These guys show income when they need to make moves and uh, um, make acquisitions. So for example, you may have an investor that lost a million dollars in 2009. They can carry forward that loss for what, a decade? And so depending on when and how they use that loss is the method for which they displayed um, uh, the amount of income. Now carry forward loss doesn't count against you from a mortgage standpoint. That's one of many tools. Uh, uh, another tool is when you, um, you, how and when you use improvements to different properties. Um, our cost segregation um, um, expert is going to talk more about that um, with depreciating assets. But for example, you have the option to depreciate or not depreciate your improvements in the year which they occur. You may want to show more income for a couple periods of, uh, of years in order to qualify for certain things in the upcoming year. For example, you may want to show a lot of income in 2018 to qualify for something in 2019. Um, I'm going to go over different types of loans. I'm going to touch on them. And this is more of just an experience to know how many different types of loans there are out there. As far as owner-occupied residential loans are concerned, there's Fannie Mae which is the largest purchaser of loans. There's Freddie Mac, her brother, which will let you uh, um, use one year's tax returns to qualify for mortgages. So with a Freddie Mac style loan, you can qualify in 2019 for returns made in 2018. Um, FHA, borrowers with lower credit scores, three and a half percent down. FHA, Home Equity Conversion Mortgage, the reverse mortgage for 62 and older. That's actually even a foreclosure rescue program for a lot of seniors and um, there's low credit and income requirements. That is the only program that's owner occupied that's not debt to income ratio based for Dodd-Frank. Um, VA, 100% uh, financing, USDA. And um, Fannie and Freddie I know will allow uh, financing in irrevocable trusts, I'm sorry, uh, revocable trusts, but not irrevocable trusts. But none of these will allow title to be vested in an LLC at closing. Um, now, if you transfer title to a single member LLC after closing, I've never actually seen a problem with that in my experiences. Uh, Non-agency is none of those that I just mentioned. If it's not agency, it's neither Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, or USDA. Uh, USDA, I didn't mention, um, great for home for land. Uh, there's a guy that asked me a question earlier. I can't see your name because your name tag is Andrew. Andrew, uh, stand up for a second, Andrew. Uh, first, thank you for being a Marine. Uh, repeat the question you asked earlier. I asked you like 10 questions, so. 
can I have 10 conforming loans with Fannie and Freddie? Is that my limit? Can I have more loans after that with the bank? Uh, the short answer to that question is no, you can't. Um, but you can, but if you transfer those properties into an LLC and then pay those notes through the LLC, Fannie Mae has a policy called Fannie Mae's Continental Well, you can sit down if you want. Or you can stand, whatever you want to do. Uh, uh, Fannie Mae has a rule called continuity of liability where if you can show 12 months payment history through the LLC, it can be discounted from your DTI. Now, when you borrow money against yourself personally and you use a Schedule E, you have to show twice as much income as you have PITI liabilities reporting on your credit report to not qualify for anything. Okay? So, if you make $20,000 a month and you have 10 mortgage payments of $1,000 a month PITI, you don't qualify for anything. What about the rent? Well, that's where your 20 grand is coming from. Your 20 grand is coming from uh, rental income, right? And then you have 10 grand a month in uh, mortgage payments. So that's a 50% debt to income ratio. You, you qualify to be homeless at that point. Now, now, if your income is run through an LLC and your payments are made through that LLC, you now qualify to buy a million dollar house. That's the same person with a different structure. You'll also pay less taxes because um, if you do it as a uh, take it as a K one, you'll save yourself some some self employment tax. Um, investment properties. More on investment properties. Uh, Fannie Mae is the biggest purchaser of those. Uh, Freddie Mac again. This is the full documentation arena. The non-agency commercial loan arena is the biggest. It's growing. The rates are closing in on Fannie and Freddie. Being Fannie and Freddie's are in the mid fives after adjustments right now on a uh, investment property. There's adjustments for investment. There's adjustments for cash out. There's adjustments for sneezing if the blue wind is blowing northeasternly. You know, there's all kinds of adjustments on conventional. There's literally over a dozen, dozen adjustments. Um, when you factor in all your adjustments, your average offered interest rate on a Fannie Freddie investment cash out is about 5.75 most of the time. So if you see five and three quarter rates, you're not getting ripped off. If you're wondering why it's getting advertised at four and a quarter, welcome to our arena. That's just how it goes. Um, because their rates are advertised before adjustments. Uh, now, a non-agency loan, a commercial lender, they don't really have many adjustments. They have a cash out adjustment, they have an LTV adjustment, and that's about it. And their rates don't fluctuate that often. I think they change about once a quarter on average. All rates are changing. So, they will allow you to have an unlimited number of properties. Now, DTI changes from personal DTI, because that's no longer the factor, to debt service coverage ratio. They want to see that you're getting anywhere, depending on who you ask, most of your California-based lenders are 110%, and they'll shorten that by saying 1.1 to 1 debt service coverage ratio, and they're indifferent to what your tax returns look like. And that is where the average investor is leaning more often than not, and it, um, it's easier financing, and it's often going that direction. Um, there are some industry changes. Those of you trying to get your blanket loans, today I made a couple calls and they're asking for a minimum of seven properties to go into one blanket lien. So that's something you need to be aware of. Another thing you need to be aware of is the minimum loan amounts going up. Uh, it's now basically $100,000 on most of your soft money non-agency products. Now, if you get a $20,000 hard money loan, sure, that's, pro that's, that's highly possible because those still have no minimums. But you need to fully bake your exit strategy because a lot of times those hard money loans might have difficult outcomes when you're trying to refinance out of them. 
um, especially with the new raises in the minimum loan amounts. Um, bridge funding is another, another term for hard money. Um, full documentation commercial, we'll talk about that case by case if one has any requests. Uh, now, should you hold investment property in your name versus the name of your LLC? I think you should always hold your investment property in the name of your LLC. First of all, people forget that if someone falls on a tile, they can sue you personally for everything. You know, when you have something in an LLC, you're limiting your liability before you're uh, uh, skirting the tax consequence. Um, and that is why I, I like to see investment property in an LLC first. But secondly, um, you do have the ability to structure your business to flow through to yourself personally to have it be a more accurate picture so you can personally qualify for financing as necessary and your business more accurately reflects your personal income. Because most of you um, do hold, have a business as a real estate investor. So it would only make sense that those titles be held that way, those bank accounts be structured that way, and for that business to pay you in that way. Um, if anyone has any personal scenarios or anything, uh, we are going to have a class on that. Um, it's it's uh, qualified for mortgages. It's on December 8th. I'm teaching it. It's from 10 to 2. I think it's 100 bucks, and it's free for seniors 62 or older. If you guys have any questions for me, I'll take them. And then I'm going to pass it to the cost set guy. Perfect. Real quick, you said minimum 100 pay for a loan. Is it the appraised loan or the mortgage The loan and all. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I don't offer those, and I don't know any banks that do either. Okay. Um, uh, from six and a half to eight and three quarters. It's mainly based on the credit score of the borrower and the, the quality of the building, but there's no real adjustments between 300000 to uh, um, $1.5 million. You'll get adjustments if they're too small. You'll get positive adjustments when they get larger, uh, but they're, they're basically in that range based what on the credit. Of, what kind of positive uh, A quarter per half million to the rate. Okay. Yes, ma'am? And this might be um, a question for you or um, So I have eight or ten properties. I'm a buy and hold investor. I've had these properties for many, many years. Um, and so I'm now looking retroactively at either putting an LLC, it looks like it has an LLC. Um, and I'm trying to figure out I've had so many tenants for like 10 plus years, many of them individually. So I think the issue of piercing the um, corporate envelope or whatever may not be as pertinent for a couple of properties. So in my situation, how would you recommend setting up um, this LLC? I know there's the, I'm still trying to get my head around the S Corp and the, the other type of single member. It's more of a legal question, but I'll tell you on the financing side, um, what we'll do is we'll go to the Secretary of State and verify your ownership. We'll ask you for the operating agreement. I own most of them um, Okay, so um, generally an underwriter would verify that at the Secretary of State and checking your operating agreement. And then um, uh, that, that would be the documentation. We can answer how to transfer title. There's a couple ways to look at it. Since you've had the properties for a long period of time, 
and it's a risk proposition is very, very low for you now, I still would recommend put them in an LLC and you maybe will set maybe uh, one or two up and then set up limits. Maybe the value is going to be 750000 or one day and you put in three or how many properties will max that out. Then you have another one set up, you max that out. So let's say you end up with three or four LLCs and all the properties. But one of the biggest reasons you're setting this up is unthinkable. I mean, you know, I mean, yes, what you see is a tenant is good. What you see is the properties are paid off. But what you don't see is unthinkable. Is some they uh, um, they have a guest. They have someone come over. We're in a very litigious society. It protects you from that, and that that's probably the main thing. And and then with all those properties, you'll have an umbrella policy uh, that will tie in everything together. But, um, but then again, you'll take this uh, model and you'll sit down with your accountant and go, this is what I'm thinking about doing, get their blessing, and then you'll sit down with your insurance carrier, and then you're saying, I need to make sure I look at my umbrella policy and, um, and look at the total value of your exposure, and then they'll underwrite it, and then set it and forget it, and you're good to go. And, um, and then what will happen on your uh, tax return is your accountant will set up where this will be a pass-through uh, to your scheduled return. And so, um, and that's very easy to do. And then this gentleman's going to talk about more sophisticated things than what we've gotten into. Thank you. Thank you. I met um, Eric Oliver at the uh, uh, National RIA Convention in Utah, and uh, I have him here today. He's been working with real, real estate investors for over three years now, uh, reducing tra taxes, freeing up cash flow, and helping us to take full advantage of the tax code. Uh, he often partners with CPA firms and real estate associations. Uh, with the past with the 2018 tax laws, there's even greater opportunities to utilize tax saving strategies. Um, if you own properties, we encourage you all to hear his suggestions and strategies. Uh, without any further hesitation, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Oliver with the top, uh, Cost Segregation Authority. Sam, before you go, don't go too far. I got a quick question. So, how many married men are in here? Oh, we got a, okay. We got a room full. I'm going to ask this, Sam, on behalf of all these married men. You're telling me that there's an agreement that I can have you draw that declares whether or not me or my wife is a decision maker. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to speak on behalf of all the men in here. I know who the decision maker is in my house, and it's not me. <laughs> so, I just have to come to you, pay you $6.95, and then we're done. That's it. $700. Oh, $700, yeah. okay. $5 this, extra, dude. It's worth every penny of that $700. If I, can. I say that, with my, of course, my wife's not here, so I, would be saying, I wouldn't be saying that if my wife is here. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. That was great. Um, second, one more quick question. Are we in Cobb County? Can someone tell me? Because my phone's been going off since I got here. That it's about to flood. So are we in Cobb County? Okay. So we've got a half hour before we have to, have to hit the, uh, <laughs> before the flood's coming, because all day long, every about half hour, it's like Cobb County's flooding. It's coming, it's coming. So tons of rain here today. Uh, I'm not used to all this rain. Um, Rick actually said I'm from California. I'm actually born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is the desert. So four inches of rain that you guys get in an afternoon, that's what we get all year. So, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna work through these pretty quick tonight. Um, we've got about a half hour. I know you guys have been here a long time. And when I tell you we're going to talk about taxes, usually about half the room leaves, so I don't see anyone leaving yet, so that's great. Um, is anyone familiar with cost segregation? Got a few people? All right, so we're really going to talk about cost segregation. We're going to learn about this less understood tax strategy. I'll be the first to tell you I'm not a CPA. I know this young gentleman up here is handing out cards. I believe you're a CPA. <laughs> yes, he is. So he's got cards if you have questions. So I'll take the easy questions. I'll defer the hard questions to him. Um, we're also going to illustrate this low risk, high value cost segregation. Um, talk about some of the new tax law and how it's impacted cost segregation. Um, it's really amplified the benefits of cost segregation, and we kind of touch on that. Illustrate how these apply to your investing, and um, go from there. So, does anyone see the hidden tiger in this picture? It's not the big tiger in the middle, I'll tell you that. There's actually another hidden tiger in that picture. On the right? That's not it either. I get that all the time. Those are not the eyes of the hidden tiger. 
Anyone else? No. No? Sorry, I had to Google the answer. In the stripes here, it says the hidden tiger. <laughs> For reason, that's, a, that's my one interactive slide I have. So, uh, so the reason for that is you guys who own properties, you probably have some deductions that you're not aware of, and that's what we're going to try and find out today. So we're going to get, get, jump into that. Does everyone understand the concept of depreciation and how that works? When you buy properties, you're able to depreciate those properties and take those expenses, that depreciation expense, and help offset income? Typically, you depreciate your real estate either over 27 and a half years for residential rentals or residential properties, and 39 years for commercial property. And that's, so you basically take, you buy a $39 million building, you divide it by 39, you take about a million dollars of depreciation expense each year, and you get to use that to offset income. Cost segregation is accelerated depreciation. And what, what it is, it's an engineering-based study where we come in and we actually have one of our cost engineers come into the building and say, okay, how much five-year assets are in this building? The IRS says that this carpet is a five-year asset. That chandelier is a five-year asset. These can lights are five-year assets. The sconces around the side are five-year assets. So what we do is, oh, whoops, what's happened here? So what we do is we, uh, one second here, there we go. What we'll do is we'll come in and segregate out the building into different asset lines. Um, oh, that reminds me, I see people taking pictures of the slides. I'm going to pass this around. If you want to copy the slides, just write your name and put your email address, and I'll be happy to send those to you. All right, so cost segregation, we're going to come in and we're going to segre segregate out those different components according to the IRS. Again, the IRS says carpets are five-year assets, so there's no need for us to depreciate that over 39 years or 27 and a half years if we can take this and depreciate it over five years. The benefit of that is, is that we get those deductions up front. So instead of letting the IRS hold our money for 27 and a half years or 39 years, let me have my money now. I'm going to go invest in a boat or a new piece of property or what have you, but it's basically an interest-free loan from the government. Well, developing the cash flow by having these uh, depreciation expenses accelerated. Here, right here, these are some accounting terms, but basically we're reclassifying 1250 property into 1245 property. So from real estate property to personal property. So again, carpet, I keep using the example carpet, I'll use that throughout. The carpet is personal property. The IRS is a five-year asset, so we should appreciate it as so, and that's what kind of a cost segregation study does. Um, no, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right, is this a tax loophole? I'm going to ask my CPA in the front row, is this a tax loophole? No. No, thank you. <laughs> this is not a tax loophole. There's actually an IRS audit guide that tells us how we can do this. So oftentimes we get, well, you know, is this some kind of tax loophole? No, it's not. I don't know if you guys remember the uh, Trump election not too long ago. People were saying, let's see your tax return. I hear you're not paying any taxes. He might own some properties, and he might be using the same strategy as a way to not pay so much taxes. So. It's not illegal, it's just good tax planning. And uh, it doesn't work for everybody, depending on the property, depending on your tax situation, but we'll get into some examples here. But it's definitely not a tax loophole. And again, this isn't working, so I'm gonna have to try to advance it here. All right, very short history. We used to have five or six slides on the history of cost segregation, and that'll really put you to sleep. As if tax, as if these uh, tax stuff isn't going to, but Real quick history, Hospital Corporation of America. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah. They're, uh, I think they've got hospitals here in Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. But they're in Mid-Atlantic. They're based out of Tennessee. They've got hundreds of hospitals across the Mid-Atlantic. They were strapped for cash in the late 90s. They said, listen, why are we depreciating all this stuff within our hospitals over 39 years? We just bought a hospital. It's got all this personal property there. Why don't we depreciate it over the, the life that the IRS says we can? So they had some pretty savvy accounts. They came up with a $70 million tax deduction. So of course that raised red flags and they it went all the way up to the highest court and they ruled that 95% of what HCA or Hospital Corporation of America was doing was actually legitimate and that's kind of where modern day cost segregation was born. So in the early, excuse me, the late 90s, early 2000s, cost segregation was really for hotels, hospitals, casinos, really large properties. Um, that's because the studies were $20,000, $25,000, $15,000 during the study, so you had to have that big of a property in order to offset the cost of the study. Uh, nowadays, we've streamlined it. We're doing single-family rental homes that are you know, $80,000. Um, 
When you pay us $1,500 to do the study, we're going to save you $10,000 on your taxes. It's really a no-brainer if it works for you and if you're in the right situation. So my job really is I just say, I'm going to charge, I'm going to charge you $1,500, I'm going to save you $10,000. You say yes or no, most of you will say yes. Or I'm going to say, I'm going to charge you $1,500, but I'm only going to save you $1,200. The answer is no. It's, it's, once you guys get the numbers in front of you, it's really a no-brainer. $10 million property. I got this guy who owns 40 duplexes. And I'm like, well, great, what's his name? Like, those, those work great for him. It doesn't matter if it's 40 rental homes. But that is great. That's a, a, one of the common misconceptions. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, so that was a short history on Healthcare Corporation of America, where cost segregation was born. There's really three tests to identify personal property. One is if the property can be removed without damaging the building. Again, I use this carpet as an example. If I rip this carpet off, the building better not collapse, right? I remove that sconce off the wall, the building's not going to collapse. Mm -hmm. The second is if the relationship between the asset and the machinery is so close that it will be retired at the same time. Um, anyone know what need is? Does anyone know what a meadery is? Or a meat? No drinkers in here? Oh, yeah. There we go. See, I know who the drinkers are. Okay, the guy with the beer in the front. Of course he knows. <laughs> so mead is fermented honey, is what it is. So we did a cost segregation study for a meadery in Prescott, Arizona, and they had specialty cooling equipment because these big barrels of honey in their warehouse had to be kept at a certain temperature. If it was too hot, um, it was very runny and hard to work with, and obviously if it's too cold, it's very thick. And so um, because of that, we were able to reclassify that heating and air conditioning unit for that specific unit as personal property. Um, and the last one is the relationship between the asset and the business is unique. For example, a, a, clean, cool, or excuse me, a clean room, cooling, um, gas station canopies, those can be reclassified as, as personal property as well. Here's a few items that uh, commonly are classified. Here's your real property. You think about a building. Again, this is 39 or 27 year assets. That's your still structures, your roofs, your uh, drywall, um, sheetrock, HVAC systems, plumbing, electrical. Here's the stuff that we come in and segregate. All your outside stuff is probably a 15 year asset. So curbs, gutters, drainage systems, retaining walls. Uh, we'll go out and count trees and shrubs. Uh, we did a study for one of the Netflix buildings in California, and in order for them to build the building, the county said, for whatever tree you take out of that forest right there, you're going to have to plant a tree. And so we were lucky enough to get the landscape plans, but they had over 14,000 trees. And all those, we put a value to those, and that's a 15-year asset. We did, we'd appreciate that over 15 years instead of 39 years, so it's a huge benefit on the tax deduction. Um, and then your five and seven year property, your carpet, countertops, cabinetry. You know, you think about multifamily, think about how many cabinets are in a multifamily, you know, an eight flex or an apartment complex. How many cabinets, countertops, appliances, plumbing for the appliances, um, electrical for the appliances, those can all be reclassified into five year property. Whoops. And just note this, because we're going to talk about this in a second. Both the 15 year and the five year and the seven year are all bonus eligible. We'll talk about that here in a second. All right, quick case study. $400,000 fourplex purchased in July of 2017. That's an important date right there. Keep that in mind with the new tax law. That's important. Um, so July of 2017. Uh-oh, what's going on? You know, I got fat fingers of this, this yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. I'm hitting the up and down button, maybe. Okay. So, $400,000 fourplex, bought in July of 2017. We're doing the tax return for 2018. Here on this left side, and this might be hard for you guys to see in the back. Like I said, I'll get you guys the slides. But basically, this is your straight line depreciation over 27 and a half years. It's about $14,000, $14,500. You get to take as a depreciation expense um, if you were to straight line depreciate that over 27 and a half years. With a cost save study, we're going to come in and we're going to reclassify $68,000 of that $400,000 into short asset life, or into a five-year category, $4,000 into a seven-year category, and $60,000 into a 15-year category. And what that does is it allows us to depreciate this $68,000 over five years. So you see those numbers there. As opposed to having to depreciate it all over... 27 and a half years. So we're front loading that depreciation and taking those deductions up front. And the idea behind cost segregation is the time value of money is the big thing. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar 27 and a half years from now. So I want to take my deductions today. And then um, 
I'll get into the other benefits here in a second. But so in this example, we've increased depreciation in 2018 by $38,000. You take that times your tax bracket, in this case we use a 39% tax bracket, that's a $14,000 savings. That's not a $400,000 forecast. That's the tax savings in year one, $14,000. Yes? What happens if you sell the property, say, in three years? Great question. That's the question we get asked most often. You do have to pay a recapture on that depreciation. So the IRS says, we're going to let you take that depreciation. What's that? Yes, yes. You're allowed to take the depreciation, but you have to pay a portion of that back upon sale. But again, the idea is I'm going to take my deduction at the highest rate, and in three years, I'm going to pay it back at a much lower rate, and I'm going to pay back less money. I'm going to pay back on a, on, on a lower amount. So you're going to pay back less on a lower amount. But you do have to pay portions of it back. And we're going to get into an example here when we show you that. Um, so some of the bonus benefits of, of cost segregation, one is catch-up depreciation. A lot of people will say, well, I've had a building for five years, but, but I didn't do a cost of study when I bought it. I mean, does it still apply? The answer is yes, it does. Those are sometimes the best studies because we can actually go back and take that five years of missed depreciation and drop it in your current tax return. And we don't have to amend the return. We just fill out, part of our service, we fill out a form 3115, which is change in accounting method. And we let the IRS know, hey, We've changed the way we're depreciating our building. We used to straight line depreciate it, now we're accelerating it. And here's the deduction, and you get to take that off your income. Yes? No amendment. No amendment. No amendment. Yes, that's very important. That's less, that's yes, that is less money. You're right. There's no amendment. It's just a simple form that we fill out. And actually, I can't speak for, I'm not here to make a sales pitch for our company, but I know a lot of companies out there don't do the 3115. And I've known CPAs that charge anywhere from $750 up to $2,000 just for that form. It's a nine-page form. It's included in our services, but I think there's other companies out there that include it as well. But just something to keep in mind. So the first thing is the bonus, uh, the catch-up depreciation. Keep in mind this can apply to existing properties. It doesn't have to be new stuff. The second thing is the reduced recapture. And that was a question you asked, and I'll walk through that here in a second. Partial asset disposition we'll get to, as well as bonus depreciation. So let me jump into these. Catch-up depreciation. For existing properties, the IRS provides an automatic consent, and that's the important phrase there, not amended return, automatic consent procedure to catch up this depreciation. Requires this form 3115. Same example we used earlier, but instead of buying it 17, let's say I bought it in 2014. So I've owned it now for four years. I get to take this four years of depreciation here, this number here, actually. And I get to drop that in my current tax return. So in this example, same example, $400,000 fourplex, bottom 14, I just created a $68,000 depreciation expense, which equates to about a $25,000 tax savings on my current tax return. Think about if you own single family rental homes, maybe you've had since 2011, you might have only paid $150,000 for them, but we're gonna take all that missed depreciation from 2011 to 2018 and drop it on your current tax return. All right, sell an asset. Back to your question. Aren't I just going to pay this all back? We get that all the time. No, you're not going to pay it all back. So one, you have the time value of money. And two, when you pay it back, you don't have to pay recapture, or you, pay, you do pay recapture on the personal property, but it's at a lower rate. So the, and I'll, I'll walk through that here right now. So. Apartment complex purchased in 2012 for 2.5 million. We sold it five years later for 3.3 million. Important to remember five years, from 2012 to 2017. Typical transaction, this is a bad cost segregation study. You've got um, selling price is 3.3 million. You've, you've depreciated 500,000 of that over the five years. Your gain on your sales, 1.3. There's two taxes you have to pay upon sale. One is capital gains tax, and one is the recapture on the depreciation. Those two numbers are listed here. 500,000, or excuse me, the, the 125,000, your recapture tax is 25%. So remember that, you're paying 25% of that back, but I took it to 39%. So that 14% is going in my pocket, if you're at that 39% tax bracket. Um, Capital gains tax is 20% of the highest, could be 15, could be zero, but you're paying 20% on this $800,000 gain. Your total tax bill, when it's all said that, is $285,000 on that transaction. Bought it for 2.5, sold it five years later for 3.3. Of that, I got to pay $285,000 to go. 
No one likes to write that check. I promise you. With a cost segregation study, it's the same idea, but now that we have we have these this property broken up into five, seven, fifteen, and twenty-seven and a half year property. It all flows out the same. Well, let me ask you guys a question. My five. Is anyone familiar with cost segregation? Got a few people. All right. So we're really going to talk about cost segregation. We're going to learn about this less understood tax strategy. I'll be the first to tell you I'm not a CPA. I know this young gentleman up here is handing out cards. I believe you're a CPA. <laughs> yes, he is. So he's got cards if you have questions. So I'll take the easy questions. I'll defer the hard questions to him. Um, we're also going to illustrate this low risk, high value cost segregation. Uh, talk about some of the new tax law and how it's impacted cost segregation. Um, it's really amplified the benefits of cost segregation, and we kind of touch on that. Illustrate how these apply to your investing, and. Um, Go from there. So does anyone see the hidden tiger in this picture? It's not the big tiger in the middle, I'll tell you that. There's actually another hidden tiger in that picture. On the right, yeah, yeah. On the right? That's not it either. I get that all the time. Those are not the eyes of the hidden tiger. No. No? Sorry, I had to Google the answer. In the stripes here, it says the hidden tiger. Study <laughs> where we come in and we actually have one of our cost engineers come into the building and say, okay. How much five-year assets are in this building? The IRS says that this carpet is a five-year asset. That chandelier is a five-year asset. These can lights are five-year assets. The sconces around the side are five-year assets. So what we do is, oh, whoops, what's happened here? So what we do is we, uh, one second here, there we go. What we'll do is we'll come in and segregate out the building into different asset lights. Um, oh, that reminds me, I see people taking pictures of the slides. I'm going to pass this around. If you want to copy the slides, just write your name and put your email address. I'd be happy to copy but I know a lot of companies out there don't do the 3115, and I've known CPAs that charge anywhere from $750 up to $2,000 just for that form. It's a nine page form. It's included in our services, but I think there's other companies out there that include it as well. But just something to keep in mind. So the first thing is the bonus, uh, the catch-up depreciation. Keep in mind this can apply to existing properties. It doesn't have to be new stuff. Total tax bill now is two hundred thousand dollars or two hundred three thousand. You saved eighty-one thousand dollars on that transaction by having a cost segregation study done. Mm -hmm. So I saved eighty-five thousand at the end, and I had that money in my pocket for the last five years, as, as opposed to the IRS holding on to it for those years. So this is this is a, this is a little bit advanced. Like I said, I'm going to send you guys a slide, but just think about this. Are you going to sell your five-year asset for more money than you, than you bought it four or five years ago? Unless this, unless this building that I bought is full of antique cars or antique paintings that are going to appreciate, then your, your recapture is going to be less. And just keep that in mind. Um, we're going to base, what we're doing is we're shifting all of, the, all of the gain over to the capital gains bucket and getting it out of the, I'm not selling my five-year assets for a gain. That would be crazy. This carpet's not worth more today than it was five years ago. So we're shifting all of our gain over to a 20% tax bracket or possibly a 15% tax bracket. But I took that deduction five years ago at a 39% tax bracket. So that's all savings going in my pocket, permanent tax savings. Any questions on that? Uh, yes, in the back. One question. What happens if you're already on the property for, let's say, 10 years? Can you still do that? Yes. If you've owned the property for 10 years, you can still do it. We do it up to about 20 years. After about 20 years, you pr pretty much use all the depreciation up. But 10 years, yeah, absolutely. We run a free benefit analysis, and we'll say, when did you buy the property? How much did you pay for it? And we can tell you, here's about what we expect to increase the depreciation by here the tax savings. Okay. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. What happens if you do a lifetime change, and you have done this on the property that you're changing? So you do have to pay some additional, well, in the past, it worked great because you can exchange personal property for personal property and real property for real property, and there was really no consequence. Now you can no longer exchange personal property. That's part of the new tax law. In 1031 exchanges, you can no longer exchange personal property. So it does cause an additional boot that you're going to have to pay. However, what they've done to fix that is that now they have, and we'll get into that here in a second, 100% bonus depreciation. So when you do when you get your new property, you're gonna have more deductions than you'll ever know what to do with. So don't you get capped out when you get deductions? No, the, the, whatever deductions you can it just keeps going forward indefinitely. It'll just keep going over indefinitely. So you don't always it doesn't always make sense to fully utilize it. In the new tax law, you can actually take 50% bonus if you'd like, instead of 100 percent bonus. 
And I'm, I'm going to touch on bonus depreciation and, and, and take it over the next 27 and a half years, the remaining. So if you don't want this huge, I mean, we're, we're creating deductions that people can't use at this point. Yes, you absolutely are. So unless you classify yourself as a real estate professional, which means you can then take these deductions to offset all your income, or you have a lot of income coming in from these income properties, we're creating deductions that, create deductions that you may never use. One thing is they've changed a lot. You used to only be able to roll those forward for 20 years. Now you can roll them forward indefinitely, which is good. But again, you're not going to want to pay us to do a study and we'll just have to roll forward 27 and a half years because then you just paid us and you're still getting, you know, you're back to where you started. So, so there are different ways. We can just reclassify the five-year stuff to get you that deduction up front. Cost segregation is one of the few tax planning strategies that is very flexible and you can kind of put it in your pocket and use it. We'll work with a CPA and we'll say, okay, what's his income this year? Okay, that's the number we need to get to. Perfect. We're going to do a cost saving on this property, this property. We're only going to do 50% bonus on this property. We're going to do 100% bonus on this property. And therefore, we just wiped out the, the income that they needed for that year. So it's very flexible. You don't have to use it all in one year. You don't have to, you don't have to do all your properties at once. You can kind of pick and choose when you use these different, different uh, strategies. Yes? So does this only offset income from real estate? Yes, this is a this is considered a passive loss, so it's got to go against passive income. Okay. That is correct. So if you don't have passive income, it may not make sense. Yes, in the back. Yeah, just clarify. Um, if I've had a property for a long time and I've um, depreciated five refrigerators to zero, and then I sell the property, what happens to the previous depreciations? Are they gone? Do I have to recapture? Uh, no, not if it's five refrigerators. I wouldn't. One? Do I have to recapture one or two? No, no. I wouldn't recapture any of them. I mean, that's just my, I'm a, probably a little more aggressive, but I wouldn't recapture any of those. Uh, you should have, once you, once you uh, we'll get the partial asset disposition, but once you dispose of those, you should have expensed those next time year, and they're off the books anyways. And we can talk about that after if you'd like, but yeah, you should well, the have. Books, the, the tax return shows them. Depreciated down to zero, which is fine, but then I wouldn't. It's not going to factor into the recapture tax at the end um, okay. on an amount like that. I wouldn't consider sure. that right now. I wanted to add something. Yeah. Um, depreciation and depletion are two of the uh, uh, intangible expenses you can add back into income uh, for uh, qualifying for financing. So if you happen to be in a scenario where you take off a couple hundred thousand dollars for depreciation and depletion and arrive at a, 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 a whatever net income uh, that can be added back and that is your new uh, AGI for uh, qualifying for financing. Yeah, that is important because we get asked that a lot. Well, if I show zero income, how am I going to get a loan? Well, any sophisticated lender is going to take all the depreciation and add it back in. It's a non-cash deduction. Um, we're going to touch on partial asset dis disposition. I know we're kind of crunched for time here. Um, partial asset disposition, if you think about it, if you buy a property and you have a roof on there, or let's say a roof, for example, and you put that asset in the depreciation schedule as a 39-year asset, and I dispose of the roof or I retire the roof and put a new roof on, oftentimes what happens is I got this 39-year asset for a million bucks, then I go spend another $60,000 on a roof. So now I got a million dollars depreciating here, $60,000 depreciating here, and they're, they're both depreciating side by side. Part of this million dollars is my roof, right? I bought a roof when I paid a million dollars for that building. I can ex if I do a cost segregation study, I now have a value to that roof, and I can exp expense the remaining basis of that, value, of that roof in the current year. So let's say the roof was a million bucks and we depreciated, no, I said that's not a good example. The roof is $100,000. We depreciated $60,000 of it. I still have $40,000 of the basis on the books. I can expense that with no recapture in that year if I have that segregated out. And then I'm going to put my new roof on the depreciation schedule and I'm going to depreciate that by itself. And there's no point in us depreciating two roofs because what happens if we sell that? question back there is I got to pay recapture. So now you're inflating the amount of recapture you have to pay because you're depreciating two roofs, one roof that's been gone for five years and another roof that you just replaced it with. So that's oftentimes what we see on depreciation schedules is 
opportunities where we can expense stuff and we're not expensive because we don't have the cost segregation study to expense it out and know what the value of that, those items are. You see it oftentimes with roof, HVAC systems, uh, that kind of thing. But that's kind of how partial asset disposition works. Um, another great benefit of, of cost segregation. All right, so we're going to jump into this bonus depreciation. This is probably the most exciting thing. Well, you're going to see in my presentation, I'll say. So I know it has to do with taxes, so I mean, just stay with me here. Bonus depreciation is, is, is huge. It's taken everything I just said and it's amplified it 10 times, 20 times. So we're going to talk about that. And I don't know if we'll get into opportunity zones, but like I said, I'm going to send you guys the slides so you'll have that. Bonus depreciation, the old law, before the tax changes. First thing it did is it required original use property, meaning if I, back in 2015, if I built a duplex, the IRS allowed me to take bonus depreciation on that. So what that meant is they let me take 50% bonus depreciation on that. So I could take 50% of that value or the, the money I put into that duplex and I could depreciate it in the first year. The remaining 50% would be depreciated over 27 and a half years. So this was kind of like a simple cost segregation study, but you didn't have to pay us to do the cost segregation study. The IRS just said, hey, you're going to take 50% of the, of the, uh, the purchase price of the building cost and, the, and expense that in the first year. So that was great. That was, that was wonderful. But it had to be original use property. This was something that the government put in to help stimulate the economy. You had to go out and build stuff. You had to go do TIs to a building. But anytime you did that, you were eligible for these bonus depreciation numbers. The other thing is it had to be a, a recovery period of 20 years or less. What's the recovery period on residential rentals? 27 and a half. Does that apply? It has to be under 20 years. What about commercial? 39 years? Doesn't apply, right? What happens if I come into a cost tax study and I just identify 20% of that building as a five-year asset. Does that apply? Yes. yes. So again, that's what, that worked great. Those were the two kind of stipulations back then. Well, there's a new tax law. With the new tax law, the great thing it did was it eliminated the original use property. So now if I go buy an existing building after September 27th of 2017, I go buy a $100,000 eightplex. Well, that's not, that's not really interesting. I go buy a $500,000 eightplex. Even if it built in 1979, I get to take depreciate, bonus depreciation on that on that eight plus. Doesn't have to be new property, and it's no longer 50 percent. Does anyone know what the new bonus depreciation numbers are? 100 percent. Exactly right. So now it's 100 percent. Still has a requirement of 20 years or less. So this is great because when, when they were talking about the tax law, Trump was talking about we're just going to expense everything. You go buy a million dollar building and just write off a million dollars in the first year. I'm like, investors are going to love that, but I'm not going to like that because I'm out of a job. Because you don't need me to come in and do a cost segregation study if you're just going to expense the whole damn thing, right? <laughs> so I didn't think it was going to pass, and luckily it didn't pass. But what they did pass is now it actually turned out great for us because now, in order to get that 100% bonus on those assets, what do you have to have? You have to have 20 years or less. How are you going to know what your 20-year property is if you don't call me to find out what it is? You've got to find out what the 20-year assets are. So that million-dollar eightplex, you've got to call me to come in and do a study on it to say, you've got $300,000 worth of five-year property and $100,000 worth of 15-year property. You now get to take that $300,000 and that $100,000 and you take 100% of it in the first year. So you think about that. On typically what we segregate out is about 30%. So as you guys are buying properties, any properties you purchase after September 27th of 2017, just make the calculation in your head, once you minus the land value, because you don't get to depreciate land. So if it's a million dollar property, you take 20% out for land, you're left with $800,000. You get to take about a third of that $800,000 or $240,000 and expense that in the first year. So, I mean, these numbers, again, this is Trump saying this is huge. <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> It's almost like the guy who signed the bill might own some buildings, right? Whether you like him or not, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. What he's done for real estate is great. I wouldn't want to date my daughter. But that's neither here nor there. But it is, it, it is huge. It's, it's, I hate saying that now because it says it up there. It's big, all right? It's big. So any questions on that? 100% bonus depreciation is a big, big deal. Now it makes sense to do a cost tax study on a $100,000 single family rental home because I'm going to segregate out 30% of that. You're going to get a $30,000 appreciation expense in your first year. 
Take that 30,000 times your tax bracket, that's your tax savings, and I'm gonna charge 1,200 bucks for the study. So, <laughs> yes, in the back. We buy a house and we rehab it. What's that? We buy a house and rehab it. Is that the same thing as, instead of buying a house for 100,000 or put 100,000 in, buy a two hundred thousand dollar basis? Is that what you do this with? Yes, if you buy it for 100,000, you put $100,000 into it, absolutely. The trick is you can't turn around and sell it the same year. So if you're fixing and flipping houses, cost segregation may not be the best strategy for you. It sometimes will work if you hold it over a tax period. So I bought it in September, I rehab it, I sell it in February, sometimes it'll work, but we don't see that that often. Typically this is a strategy if you're buying and holding properties that works really well. Oh, same example, $400,000 fourplex, but this time I purchased it after that September 27th deadline. My depreciation expense on that year was $129,000, and that's a tax savings of $49,000. And that's, again, if you purchased it on the 26th of September, it would be much less, but that's because that's when that new tax law took effect. Please don't ask me why it's September 27th, 2017. My guess is somebody in Congress bought a property on the 28th, and they needed a vote. <laughs> Because everything else in the tax law starts January 1st, 2018, but this is the one thing that was backdated to the September 27th. Who knows where that number came from, but. Any questions on bonus depreciation? Yes? Huh? Yes. Yep, so the bonus depreciation will apply if you purchased it after September 27th. If you didn't, you want to do the cost segregation study anyways, because it's probably going to create a big deduction because of that missed appreciation of that catch up study that we talked about. Just send me the spreadsheet. I'm going to run a benefit analysis on all 40 of those, and I'm going to send it back to you and say, on this property, I'm going to say this much, on this property, I'm going to say this much. And then you look at your income and you say, okay, Eric, I want to do these four properties this year to offset my income for this year. Or call this guy in the front row, he'll be happy to help you. <laughs> but yes, that's absolutely correct. If they're paid off, doesn't matter. Yep, we're still taking depreciation on so that. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to get to that here. I'm almost done. But basically, what I need is the address, the year you purchased it, the type of property, whether it's a residential rental or a medical office or what have you. Yeah, it'll be on the slide here. And then the purchase amount. Well, those four pieces of information, I can get that back to you within 24 hours. Let me know what you're saying. What are your costs? Did you? <laughs> no, no, we're just, you know, we do studies all over the country, yeah. So I'm actually driving to Alabama after this to go do a site visit on the property. <laughs> all right, so when would you do a study if you currently own properties, if you purchase any new properties, if you renovate, remodel, or make leasehold improvements to properties? before you sell, and properties with a 754 step up. So, I know we didn't get into a couple of these, but there are some benefits potentially even before you sell. And again, that has to do with reduce, reducing that recapture um, and taking the, the deduction at a higher rate. So. All right, I don't, how are we on time? I don't have time. We're done? Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm just gonna say this real quick. We didn't get into opportunity zones. Has anyone heard of opportunity zones? Yes. It's becoming a more and more hot topic button. In, this, in the slides here, it talks about the three different tax benefits of opportunity zone, investing in those zones. I've also included in here a map, and this is hard to tell, but if you go to this website right here, eig.org, you can actually drill down to the street level. Basically, for, for all you guys who haven't heard of it, if you invest, you take capital gains and you invest in one of these opportunity zones, which are mapped out here, there's a potential for very big tax savings. So look into it. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. Uh, sorry I couldn't get into it tonight, but it's another opportunity to save money on your taxes. It's kind of like it's similar to the 1031 exchange, but I think it's a little more flexible. And the benefits, I think, are a little greater. Uh, there's my contact information. Thank you guys again. You guys have been great. Um, any questions? I've got business cards if you have questions. Feel free, I'll be here for a while if you have any questions. Um, yeah, did the sheet make it over? All right, it's right here. I think everybody got it but you front guys here. So, okay, so I think it's just these, these front rows here. 
Uh, but if you want the slide, stay here and I'll make sure you get it. Yes. Thank you.